welcome to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast, where we meet experts from all walks of life to learn their intrinsic motivation so that they can share it with the world. What do we have in store today? Stay tuned to find out more. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. This is another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I'm David. And we are in the middle of August, but our guest today is scaring me for Halloween is probably the date we should have had this guy because he believes that the summer – no, I don't think you guys heard me – the summer – he said this, he believes the summer is the best time to beat sugar addiction. And so who is this guy that's going to scare us for the next hour? Well, one of the first categories that we have as far as a stat, you know we love stats, 70% of the U.S. population is addicted to sugar, and that sets them up for diabetes, weight gain, foggy thinking, irritability, even anger issues. So when you're arguing with your mate, it may, they may not even be angry with you. It could be a, a byproduct of sugar, you know. How much sugar is safe for children as, a, as opposed to us adults? Do we need to give them any at all, or do we need to go cold turkey? Well, our guest is a, a multiple certified personal trainer. He's a level three holistic lifestyle coach and also a nutritionist. He holds a bachelor's degree in exercise science from the University of Utah. He has a book, a new book out, Exercising Your Excuses, Heal Your Mind, Honor Your Body, Manifest Your Dream, and he is the owner and founder of Lifelong Fitness out of Utah. Without further ado, Griff Nielsen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Hamza. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yes. Absolutely. So I, you know, tongue in cheek, of, of course, because uh, as I was thinking about, you know, sugar, right, and when's the good time to do it, and then I was like, do I have, do, doth I protest too much? <laughs> because is it, when is a good time, right? Like I said, Halloween, then that's Halloween candy, and then the holidays, so that's sweets, and then the beginning of the year, football parties, sweet, sweets. It's it's like, oh my goodness, it's around every part of the life. And is that just me or 70% of the population? Well, you know, it's a great question, Hobbs. It's interesting because really my ultimate answer is there any time is a good time to quit sugar addiction. And obviously – I'm making the case for summertime, but really any time is a great time for that. Uh, One of the reasons I I propose that summertime is a really good time for it is because fruit and natural foods and, you know, foods that are designed to give us pleasure – they are bountiful. I mean, they're very plentiful during the summertime. And so it's just a great natural time just to, to qualm some of that sugar addiction, some of that rage that uh, <laughs> seems to soar within us. Absolutely. Well, one thing that as you were talking, I was thinking about some of my colleagues, like I know uh, fitness trainers, I know hypnotherapists and such, and, you know, every business has a different sales cycle, right? And so, You have people that, especially for weight loss, is the beginning of the year, New Year's resolutions, right? You want that beach body for the summer. And I wanted to know on your end, right, I worked so hard for this beach body. Is that when people usually fall off the wagon and go back to the suites in the middle of the summer? You know, interestingly enough, it is. And the reason for that, Hans, is because a lot of people, when they get into the summer, the schools are out, kids are out. And that sense of uh, continuity, having a schedule, getting in routine, that gets broken. And so I'm swimming upstream a little bit and making this proposal that summertime is a good time to break the sugar addiction because, yeah, we, we get busted out of our habits. It's easy to get caught up and, you know, going on vacations and playing a little bit and la- letting the hair down. Um, but from a purely – physiological perspective, that's where I make my case. It's physiologically, it's a great time to beat sugar addiction during the summer. Hmm. 
Absolutely. And, and I mean, it's a serious matter. Of course, I'm bringing some levity to it. But, you know, it just seems like in every, uh, you know, I was using the example of holidays, but there, it, seems to, it seems that there's sugar in everything. Uh, once upon a time, I used to hang out with the Juice, Juice Plus folks, and, and in, in their demonstrations, right, uh, you're laughing because yeah. you've probably seen this, where yeah. they would pour a glass of Coca-Cola, and yeah. how many spoons of sugar do you think are in this soda? And people would guess, and you had no idea how much sugar was just in a carbonated soda, carbonated water. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's astronomical. I, I can't remember exactly how much it is, but I know it's upwards of like 10 teaspoons or above. It's crazy the amount that's in a lot of the foods. And, and really those are kind of the obvious selections, you know, the, the soda pops and uh, the ice cream, that those are the obvious things. But what about the things that are not obvious? What about spaghetti sauces? What about breads? I mean, they're even slipping it into pasta these days and different foods that, we didn't grow up having sugar in and now all of a sudden there's sugar there and it's, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And we seem as a nation, we seem to turn towards it. It seems to be our comfort food. We seem to emotionally gravitate towards it in times of stress and times of turmoil, maybe in times of tragedy. I've even, you know, myself, I've been there and coached many clients that turn to sugar and highly processed foods when life gets a little bit tumultuous and so uh, it's there, it's plentiful, it's bountiful, and that's part of the problem. Mm. So, Griff, <laughs> I mean, I guess, you know, there's a lot of information out there, and some people say this, some people say that, but is there an amount that we should be getting or, you know, consuming daily? You know, a lot of the, the guidelines that have come out, the, the World Health Organization just came out and said that men should not be getting, and obviously this is general, but men should not be getting over 37 grams of refined sugar. So I'm not talking about fruits or vegetables or anything like that, but 37 grams of the processed, highly refined stuff. Uh, women are at, are at 25 grams or below. So if you put that into perspective, I mean, that's really not a lot. Uh, you bust open like a Kit Kat or, I mean, that's for a woman, that's maybe, maybe half. It's like two of the four links. <laughs> and mm-hmm. for a guy, maybe, maybe you get three or maybe you get the whole thing. But really what a lot of the health researchers are showing is that your health consequences above and beyond those grams are going to go drastically up. We're talking as far as like uh, metabolic syndrome, uh, your proclivity to get type 2 diabetes, you name it. It starts to go up further once you pass those thresholds. Mm-hmm. So you're not talking, like you, you just mentioned, you're just talking like refined and processed uh, sugars, not like from fruit. No. Oh, no, no, no. No, I mean, from fruit, I mean, no. I, if you think about the way, I want to, I want to kind of pose it this way, Hamza. Think about our ancestors, right? Think about you know, how we as a human race came about. I mean, we were hunters and gatherers. We were out there every day foraging for, you know, berries, nuts, figs, you know, vegetables. Um, And our brain literally is hardwired for sweet. So sweet in and of itself, this is not a bad thing. You know, sweet is a good thing. Our brain looks at this and it says, yeah, you know what? Really, what that equals is survival. I mean, put yourself in wilderness, and you got your loincloth on, and you're out there, boogie boy. I mean, you're looking for everything. You're sitting there scraping and scraping. You come across a beehive, or you come across uh, a fig tree, or berries, or whatever. Our ancestors would just completely devour that. And why? Because our brain is literally hardwired. From a primal standpoint, we are physiologically hardwired to love it. I mean, it's no wonder why we're facing an obesity crisis. It's no wonder why we are so addicted to this illustrative substance known as sugars, because we are literally physiologically hardwired to seek it, to want more. And when we get it, our brain literally is saying, that is a good deal. It's a really good deal. And that equals survival. That equals you know, little babies running around. That is, that is literally the perpetuation of the human species. And the, and the sad fact of the matter is, Hans, is we have not outgrown that primal brain. 
that same brain with those same instincts, with those same neurotransmitters and hormones and everything else that's driving that impulse, it's still there. We haven't, we haven't, you know, put on our, our suits and ties and our bow ties on as far as our brain is concerned. I mean, we, we still are out in the wilderness. We're still scrimping and searching and foraging. And, and when we step into a, a, a supermarket or whatever, our brain's going, oh, yeah, baby, bring it on. <laughs> the, more the, the more the better. Come on, baby. So, I mean, it's, we're kind of in a historical paradox where, you know, we're surrounded with cheap, easy, highly addictive foods where there's 24-7 access, and we've got a brain that's saying, bring it on, more is better. I think now is the time where I would make my public ad- apology because I, once upon a time, I was a second grade teacher. And like most teachers that may listen to this podcast, sometimes the, the kids get a little unorderly. And to get them to not be disorderly, excuse me, we'd give them treats. And, you know, it's kind of that cat and mouse of, oh, if you're going to be quiet, Mr. Davis is going to give us treats. So in essence, we put them off on the wrong foot. I'm not... I have to say my public apology because, you know, I, I've done my share, but I wanted to ask you, like, how you said it were hardwired, but parents and what are the early stages where the kids, I mean, it's a lifelong issue. Um, what, what are you seeing on your end? I believe firmly, if I'm, if I'm understanding your question correctly, Hamza, I believe that it starts very early on in childhood, especially like you're saying, there is an emotional reinforcement that we get as a child when we get the lollipop, when we get the, the creamy, the ice cream, whatever it is. What we don't know is in our brain, we're literally encoding a neural pathway that says, when I get this, I feel good. When I get the ice cream, I feel awesome. I feel great. I was smiling. And so my brain logs it as this is good. Now, fast forward. So we start to get addicted very early on. We start to make these emotional connections. Whether we know it or not, our subconscious mind is making these emotional connections to sugar. And we start to form habits. A lot of experts show that 96 up to word, upwards up to 98% of all human behavior is linked to our subconscious mind. We're not thinking about it. Just like we're not thinking about when we put on our, our shirt and our clothes and we brush our teeth. We're not thinking about that. That's very subconscious. So when we get the treat as a kid and we're getting lit up from that primal brain, we're going, yeah, baby, bring me more. And we're thinking at a subconscious level, like, oh yeah, this is great. I feel amazing. You know what? We take that same emotional connection. Now fast forward 30 years and we're in a corporate environment. And our boss comes down and starts yelling at us, and why didn't you get that project in on time? And, you know, you think to yourself, oh, hell, how did, I, how did I get to this point? Well, you go down to the cafeteria, and all of a sudden, that same emotional experience is waiting for you right there. That same creamy that gave you so much emotional joy as a five-year-old, now as a 35-year-old, you're thinking, you know what? I'm under a lot of stress right now. And your brain from a subconscious level is looking at that creamy. And not only does it sound good consciously, like, yeah, that looks good, but subconsciously it says that equals pleasure. You're in a state of pain. And now you can just jump into a state of pleasure. Boom, right there. There's your creamy. Go for it. And those emotions, which were stressful, which were negative, in the blink of an eye at least have been mitigated. At least now you feel a little bit better. You're like, okay, now I can deal with the pain. Absolutely. And, and it's the summertime and you said now is the best time, but I, I was just wondering what kind of backlash did you get if you said Valentine's Day is the perfect time to stop with your sugar addiction? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I'd go there. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I'm uh, ready for that kind of backlash. You know, uh, <laughs> And I hope that makes sense. From when I said from a physiological perspective, we've got foods in the summer that are very plentiful that are going to satiate those pleasure centers of the brain. And here's, here's what I'm thinking. You know, if we can take in foods that are very nutritious, that are very sweet, that our brain is still getting a little bit of a, little bit of a reward from, at least 
from a physiological standpoint, we're not feeling deprived. It's not like we're in this mega state of pain. It's like, okay, so I, I binged on three apples. Oh, no. <laughs> it's too late, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not a big deal versus gobbling down three to five people's, or pieces of, of apple pie or cherry pie or whatever. I mean, it's a completely different uh, – it's a completely different boat. One's nourishing us, and one, on the other hand, is unfortunately keeping us enslaved in sugar addiction. So, uh, yeah, I don't think I'm ready to go to the Valentine's Day proposal. <laughs> Summer, I'm, I'm ready to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to make reference to uh, this young comedian. His name is Haha Davis. No relationship. We're not related. And. Oh. <laughs> So anyway, he, um, you know, he's a real live comedian, whatever. So he was on a, a popular radio station or on the on YouTube on uh, a couple of months ago. He's promoting a movie, so you know, it was a great story of this person uh, just virtually being an unknown on social media, and now he's getting movie roles and off, right? And so. Yeah. He smiled, and he's like less than 30. So you had used the example of uh, 5 to 35. This guy's less than 30, right? And he smiles, and, and the, the host was like, whoa, what happened to the back of your teeth? Candy. They were all gone. They were like either uh, <laughs> they were like chiseled down or they were just gums. And he was like, yeah, I was a Latsky kid. Nobody regulated the sugar I had in my life. And here, you know, he's not even middle-aged, and his teeth are gone. Wow, that sucks. <laughs> oh, that's hard. So, well, and, and you look at, it's the interesting thing. If you look at how sugar is produced in nature, there's been researchers literally like Weston A. Price that have gone to uh, uh, very primitive organizations. Now, this was back in the 30s, and he would study them, and they would eat, you know, fruit and honey. And they never had some of the same issues. They didn't have the gingivitis. They didn't have the tooth decay. They didn't have all of this rot that's coming out. And so researchers started to scratch their head. And they're like, well, how is that possible? But yet you can have the same amount of sugar from an unnatural source. You know, you're pounding soda pop or what have you. And like you're mentioning, now all of a sudden your teeth are falling out. Well, what they found is that Mother Nature equips food that comes in nature with a lot of uh, properties that stimulate uh, certain hormones that allow saliva and anti-placking materials to be circulated in the mouth. And that's how Mother Nature works versus you go to a more of a very highly refined food and you take that in. Now, all of a sudden, your teeth are falling out and you're getting gingivitis. You're getting all the tooth decay, all this good stuff. It's amazing to me, Holmes. It really is. Like, I, I know I geek out on this. I'll be the first to admit. But it's amazing to me that when we eat food that is natural, that, is, that literally grows on a tree or, or comes from the earth or something that swims on it or roams on it or whatever, if it comes from the earth, we're good. Our body knows how to handle that. It knows how to balance the acids that are eating away your teeth. It knows how to balance the, the bacteria in your gut, which is responsible for a lot of that. It's amazing how Mother Nature just has the answer. And that might sound simplistic, but, you know, when you, when you scale back and you see some of the research that's been done by researchers like Weston A. Price, it, it really is amazing. Mm. Mm. Hmm. Griff, uh, I was going to ask you, what are your thoughts on? I know you have, you know, you know about nutrition and what. What do you have any thoughts on uh, intermittent fasting? Yeah, I I believe that uh, intermittent fasting it's a good thing. You know, our body needs a good time for detoxification, and uh, I think that intermittent fasting is a really good way to to activate detoxification in, in a very toxic world. As far as, you know, we can go outside and the minute we go out there, we're breathing a lot of toxicity. A lot of the foods that we eat have toxicity in it. And intermittent fasting is a great way to kind of get that detox action going on within our body. It's a great way for weight loss. Uh, it really helps balance blood sugar. Uh, so there's, I know it's very, very trendy, very uh, almost faddish right now, but I think there's a lot of science from what I've seen on my end. There's a lot of good science backing it up and, Having done it myself, it, it definitely does help with energy levels, helps with sleep, and, and more so, even directly to our conversation, it really helps with cravings as well because it brings 
our blood sugar levels into more stable, doable levels to where we're not on a, a blood sugar roller coaster with cravings and withdrawal symptoms. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm definitely a fan of it. Mm, it seems like if if you just think about it and you go back far enough in time, that that was probably more of just the natural state of of things. We were just more of in a fasting state because we didn't have all these, you know, fast food and restaurants and just go get food anytime we wanted. You know, I think things were more geared around. You had to go, you know, hunt for the food or whatever, and then you might eat at a certain time. But obviously, food wasn't read, readily available like it is now, and so you you think people were going longer periods of time without eating, and that was just how things were. They probably didn't think much about it. You know, it's interesting, Debbie. Yeah, I agree. And and it's interesting with the the diets of today versus the diets of even 20 years ago. We look at like paleo, we look at intermittent fasting, ketogenic, all the most popular diets right now. What's the common theme? Well, the common theme is they're looking, like you were just mentioning, they're looking into how we as human beings, uh, <laughs> to coin a term, how we were raised, you know, in our infancy. We really didn't have the option of 24-7 food at our fingertips, and a lot of these diets are kind of getting back to the basics and allowing us to to have time to allow our digestion to complete itself, to allow our hormones to reset, to allow our blood sugar to come back into check, which is a really good thing because now we're not we're not in an incessant state of craving. A lot of the reason why we crave is because when our blood sugar is high. When we're, you know, doing the, the Taco Bell late night or we're getting our soda pop, we're getting our blood sugar high in a time of day that we were never, from a, from a purely primal standpoint, we were never meant to have our blood sugar elevated at that time of night or that time of evening. We were meant to be winding down. We were getting the fire stoked up. We were getting bed down, you know, under a bush or in a cave. I mean, really the body is not tuned for that. So a lot of these diets are really getting back to the basics, and I think it's it's a rather good direction that we're heading. Yeah. You know, I watch, you know, there's a lot of information out there. There's the information age, and I was watching as a, someone I follow on YouTube periodically, and he was saying that, you know, we have like a, a gallon and a half of blood in our body, and we have about a teaspoon of sugar that's in that blood, and that's supposed to be like the right amount. He's all, but on average, we consume about 30 times that daily. <laughs> so yeah. he's like, there's no wonder we have all these obesity problems. And we just consume way too much sugar. So he's kind of like right where you're at. We just, we're just all way over consuming sugar. You know, one, one thing just to take off on that, with the blood sugar, with that, that tight confinement of how our body regulates blood sugar, a lot of our conventional wisdom when it comes to weight loss or when it comes to, you know, uh, cutting out sugar or whatever, we're really obsessed about calorie counting. Um, one of the biggest fads right now is we're really into macro counting. You know, what's your macros, this, and what is your carbs and protein? But really if we step back and we look at the weight loss equation, it really comes down to what our hormones are doing within our body. So it's not really a caloric equation. It's more of a hormonal equation. And the chief, the, the chief hormone among all of those is insulin. I mean, that's your big dog. I mean, insulin is your big dog, and that is the hormone that is tampered with very heavily by carbohydrates. And, and to be more particular about that, more like the refined carbohydrates, this refined sugar – it really taps into that hormone and skyrockets it in ways that we were not designed as human beings to have it skyrocket. We were really not designed to have this escalating blood sugar and therefore an escalating 24-7 insulin cycle going on. And unfortunately, you know, you look at a lot of the disease in our country right now, there's a lot of experts that show that the genesis of anything from diabetes to stroke to cancer to heart disease to atherosclerosis, all of these things that are so prevalent right now, the genesis is when we start to tip those hormones out of balance because when we do, our body raises a red flag and says, what are you doing? Why are we? I'm not meant for this. And so it has to start to compensate with this disease process. And unfortunately, we see a lot of that right now with, with how much disease is running amok in our country. Yeah. Yeah, I have to play devil's advocate for a second because in, in my research, 
in my research, going back a couple of decades, there was a popular song that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes, it does, brother. <laughs> and you, you know what? I want to... Yeah. I yeah, I want to talk to that. I I really believe that that a little bit is is not bad. I the way that I look at it is if we can live at least an eighty twenty lifestyle, eighty so percent of the time, if we can just live responsibly and eat whole natural foods, not the processed stuff. Then you know what? If we're at a family party or whatever, and we want to not be the the weirdo in the back of the room that's not eating anything, then by all means, let's let's have something. You know, the body can handle a lot of these modern foods if it's in the minority. The problem yeah. is, is the average American is in the inverse. They're more at a seventy thirty ratio. I mean, that's a literal statistic that's still holding true today, 70% of the American diet is, is processed foods. And so if we can just switch that, I, I believe that, Hans. I believe that, uh, that it does make everything go down a little bit. I served half of my life being a sugar addict, and that's why I'm so passionate about this cause is because I know what it can do. But I also enjoy, I, I enjoy a donut every once in a while. I, enjoy, I love the hell out of ice cream. And there's so many things that I really enjoy that I don't believe that we need to completely extricate ourselves from. We just need to moderate it. Now we're best friends again, because, yeah, I can't yeah. do that. I well. <laughs> You're not going to put me on the Halloween episode now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know, but you brought up ice cream. You're on the cool side again. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. But, uh, so, Griff, I want to I, I wanna lean on you as far as an education standpoint because, sure. you know, initially you mentioned, you know, uh, the usual suspects that we think about, the soda, the ice cream and such, but uh, you said that it's being introduced in foods that traditionally didn't have it, like the spaghetti sauce and things like that. What are some uh, popular foods outside of fast food that's just happening at home where, you know, time, we may have time scarcity and you're just making something really fast unbeknownst to you that there's a ton of sugar in it? Well, I love that question. That is, that's an excellent question. Let me answer it in two ways. The first part, I believe, is if you look at a lot of your household items, things like crackers. It, it, they'll, what manufacturers are doing is they're putting just a little bit, just to, just to peak a little bit of a taste. You know, so if you're looking at a, a cracker 10 years ago or 15 years ago, probably it's more safe that you're not going to have like one to three grams of sugar. Now you do. And it, there's a lot of other things I've mentioned before, like pasta, that, that they're just starting to slip it into. Uh, if you look at alcoholic beverages, if you look at some of the trends of how much sugar has been added to alcoholic beverages over the last three decades. It's amazing. It's almost laughable to see how much has been added. So now we've got a double whammy of alcohol and the sugar that's addicting our bodies. Um, and it's it, it really one of the tricky things that the, the industry does is they start to uh, name sugar by different names. So you're not just going to see sugar on an ingredients list. So maybe you're looking at some bread and you look at the ingredients and there's something like maltodextrin or, or dextrose yeah. or something that throws you off. And you're like, well, that's not sugar. And mm -hmm. in reality, it is. Yeah. And there's just, you know, muscovado, palm sugar, panocha, powdered sugar, raw sugar. I mean, there's all sorts of little things that, that they like to throw in there. One trick that you can use is just look at the added sugars label, which by 2000, let's see if I've got my dates correct, uh, the FDA is, gonna, is, going, to, is going to mandate uh, an added sugar label on every food come, I believe it's, I could be wrong on this, but by 2020. But for now, if you just look at the sugar content, really got to, it will show you where your grams are. It's an easy way just to see, okay, how much am I taking in? And for most people, they're not looking because they're looking at products that they don't that don't typically have sugar. So that's the first part. Now here's the second part, and I won't make this too lengthy, but basically the second part of it is this. A lot of carbohydrates, including a lot of breads and still a lot of pastas, white flours, you know, these kind of things, 
they don't technically have any sugar in them. And so a lot of people will be like, oh, good, you know, I'm good. I've had a lot of people, people that I've coached over the years, they'll bring me in a food log and I'll be like, hey, you know what, your carbohydrate's really high. And then they'll retort and they'll say, well, I don't, I, I don't have any sugar. Well, the, the dirty little secret is when you take uh, a grain-based flour and you pack it into any of these and you process it, uh, you're getting essentially the same physiological response at a blood sugar level. So going back, I think, to what David was saying, you know, you have uh, uh, this little tight confinement of, about how your body regulates blood sugar at, a, at about a teaspoon level. The same thing is happening when you're having white bread that has zero sugar in it. You're getting the same response. You're still getting the same blood sugar elevation. And one little trick that I do with my clients, I say, you know what? look at this white piece of bread. And I, got a, I always have like a little loaf in my office. I said, check this thing out. It's nice and white right now. Now, I want you to imagine this hitting your throat and sliding down that esophagus. Did you know in about 10 minutes that that is going to be nice and red? And you're, it's going to be like this nice, soaked, red, sopping wet piece of bread because that's exactly what your body does is it breaks it down. So imagine just eating this, this nasty like sloppy red bread, you know, gooey piece. I mean, because that's exactly what's happening when you eat it. It turns directly into blood sugar, and we're getting a lot of the same response. So we look at if 70% of the American diet is processed, which it is, and we're consuming uh, white flours and breads and everything that, quote, doesn't have any sugar, we're still getting the same response. So... We have to be mindful of not only the obvious sources and the, and the non-obvious sources where you mentioned where the tricks come in, but also the no sugar added or the no sugar products, which unfortunately a lot of the, the food industry likes to advertise that there's no sugar, when in reality it has a huge impact on blood sugar. It can still lead to the disease process. Um, so really the answer to all of that is if we can just keep to more natural foods, we're not going to have to really worry about, you know, really having to sift through and, and make it more complex than it really needs to be, if that makes sense. Hmm. No, it does. And it makes me think of uh, people that probably come to you. Uh, I just want to put a scenario out when I was younger, you know, first time away from home and oh, vegetarian type of deal, right? And yep. so when I went to the doctor and such, my blood sugar was so much higher and they were like, your sugar consumption has gone up. And I'm like, but wait a minute, I'm not doing the, the processed foods and such. And I wanted to know on your end, are you seeing that where someone thinks they're running away from something, but they're probably doubling down? And, and just to clarify, as far as, so your friends, they were taking, or you were saying you, your friends were taking the sugar out and they still had like a bad blood profile. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it was like, um, oh, I don't eat, you know, you're, bang, you know, you're banging your chest like Tarzan. Oh, I'm so proud I don't eat meat and all this other stuff. Yet they, they still had a lot of sugar in their diet. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you were mentioning they were vegetarian, most of them then. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's the, the trick right there. You know, there is, there's so many conflicting there's so many conflicting messages out there, period, that, you know, maybe you shift to vegetarianism or veganism, all of which can be great under the right circumstance, but that still doesn't mean that you're eating, quote, clean. I mean, I've looked at a lot of vegetarian foods and everything else, and it's no wonder why our blood sugars are still floating around way too high. And again, a lot, one of the key tricks of the food industry is masking no sugar this, no sugar that, and they're absolutely right. But that's nothing more than a gimmick. And the reason that it is is because it still has the same effect. And just like your friends, they go to the doctor, oh, my A1Cs are up, which means that my blood sugar's been up too much. How can I possibly be pre-diabetic? That doesn't, mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, here's a, little, here's a little paradigm shift, and hopefully this answers your question. If we can get to a point to where we can say to ourselves, okay, most of our carbohydrate that we take into our mouths should not be grain-based. Now, that's a hard pill for a lot of us to swallow because mm -hmm. most of the foods that we're eating are very 
grain based. I mean, we love our grains. They're cheap. They make us a lot of money as a country. But at the end of the day, we know that they're highly addicting. We know that they're making us fat. We know that there's driving an obesity epidemic that is just unequaled. If we can change our paradigm and think, you know what, most of our carbohydrates, and I want you to feel feel this on a gut level when I say it, (laughs) most of our carbohydrates should be coming from veggies. I mean, most of them. I'm not talking like the, the... the starches, although they're okay, like the potatoes and that stuff, I'm talking about like leafy green vegetables, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of the fruit, a lot of the produce that you would see that if you went to a supermarket, that is what we should be subsisting upon. And I believe that until we shift away from the old school paradigm of grain, 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 it's just going to be an uphill battle. And I believe that a lot of, to your question, you know, a lot of our vegetarian friends and vegan friends, that's, they've had those same challenges. I've coached dozens of vegetarians and veganism, vegans that, that have those same issues because they go towards those foods that are what I call quasi-health foods, and they end up being the same problems. Mm, exactly. You, you said uh, something, uh, two things. You said, oh, I want you guys to fill it in your gut. And you haven't mentioned it yet, but is there association with uh, overconsumption of sugar and leaky gut syndrome? Yes, there is a huge. Uh, that's, I'm glad you asked that question. And, and really, it's the chicken and the egg. So we have to ask, okay, where, which one leads to it? For, is it the leaky gut syndrome that is causing cravings? The answer to that question is absolutely yes. And the reason for that is when we get leaky gut syndrome, we have an increased immune response. So our gut, is the, it, there is not supposed to be any leaks. It's not supposed to be perforated. Nothing is supposed to get between uh, our intestinal lining and into the blood system unless it is permitted by our intestines. Now, we blow a hole through it. It's like taking a little shotgun down there, and we blow some holes in it, and we call it leaky gut syndrome. Now, we get into a state of inflammation, and our body, in a state of inflammation, it automatically will start to crave refined sugars. And it also makes the withdrawal process. When we try to take those out, our withdrawal symptoms go way up. So, yeah, there's no question. Now, here's the other part of that chicken and the egg. So what is driving the leaky gut syndrome in the first place? Well, if we look at our modern diet, which is replete with grains and sugar and everything we've talked about, very highly acidic foods, very um, inflammatory foods, to be frank, eventually what happens is the bacteria and the mucosal lining down in our gut starts to get slowly eroded. And that's a very long story, but to keep it simple here, A lot of our lifestyle practices, and I'm not saying diet exclusively because stress and sleep and all of these things play into it, but a lot of what we're eating is creating a perfect storm for the leaky gut syndrome. And when we're, you know, going back to our earlier conversation, when we're taking in foods and we're getting addicted at an early age, over the years, uh, that mucosal lining of our intestinal system just starts to get drilled into. And so we enter into our late 20s or early 30s and we start to gain weight and we start to have all these cravings. What we don't know and what a lot of modern medicine is not recognizing yet is this leaky gut syndrome that is indeed driving cravings, which is indeed increasing our withdrawal symptoms when we try to pull away. And then we try to throw willpower at it. But what we don't understand is that we are at odds with a physiological phantom known as that leaky gut syndrome. And I say phantom because it's unknown to most. And it's a hard battle to win. The willpower usually falls to the wayside because it's, we're swimming upstream in, in our bodies just saying, hey, you know, I, I've got a problem down here and I need something to, to soothe it and, and typically we will give in. So, yeah, that's a great question. I believe that it, it very much is driving a lot of the cravings and a lot of the problems that we're facing today. And as you were talking about the different cravings and such, you know, I, I think we all like the commercials with the celebrities and, you know, I'm angry and you need a, a quote unquote fill in the blank, you know, national brand for the sugar in the middle of the afternoon. And it's a great commercial, but, you know, a lot of people find themselves, and this is just a shout out to the people that listen to us while they're working. Shout out to you guys. Uh, you know, you get that three o'clock blood drop 
right? After lunch, you're just like, I need to make these last few hours. How? What can I do to push through? And the EV outlet is the vending machine or, you know, the, the suites that are on the corner. Uh, what's a way that they can combat that? Would they bring their own fruits and veggies to the office and get laughed at? Or what do you suggest? <laughs> yes and yes. <laughs> I'm one of those, brother. I get mocked every day of my life. I'll tell you, my, own, my, only, my, my own family has disowned me. Not really. But they, uh, they'll, they'll send out like little, little uh, for like a wedding invitation. They're like, hey, all those that are bringing food, and they'll put in parentheses, all those that are normal, you know, like all these little rib jabs. So you're going to get all those all the time. You're, you're going to get the pokes and everything. I, but, but, yeah, to answer your question directly, absolutely. I believe that you do have to be prepared. I, in 20 years of coaching, I can tell you this emphatically, I have never had a client succeed long-term with changing their nutritional habits, ever, that I know of, that has done so without food preparation, without getting to a point mentally where they say to themselves, I am going to prepare my food, and I don't care if it's going to take me a little bit of time because that's the major barrier, as we all know. It's a time thing. It's not, a, it's not anything else. It's really a time thing, and it's a habit thing. If, if, food, if we're going to change a habit, we absolutely have to have a food prep practice, as I call it. And now I typically break that up into two pieces. One is you've got to look at your week. So it's a weekly prep where you say, okay, I'm looking at my week. Uh, it's either more busy or less busy than normal. Okay, now I need to get some, I need to either get some snacks or some recipes put together. I need to get my food prepped. And then on the micro prep part, and that's a daily practice, I just need to simply get it into a cooler, get it to the office, get it into a refrigerator. So when, you know, these temptations come, at least I'm prepared. At least I've got something there to where my blood sugar is not flying all over the place and I've got a a treat or a snack or a full meal for that matter, ready for me in the moment. I, I love that question because it is absolutely essential. Mm-hmm. There was an uh, article that had just come out this week and sobering news of over 100,000 deaths in the past year because of the opioid epidemic. Mm-hmm. And it's a very, you know, very sobering moment in time in our history of this country where we're dealing with this addiction and, and we're saying addiction and it's associated with, you know, hard drugs or alcohol or something like sure. that. And sure. so when you hear sugar, you know, we've done a lot of tongue in cheek, but when you say sugar addiction, you don't get the same kind of response. And some of it is related to, like you said, there's commercial interest that makes a lot of money for the country. What type of feedback are you getting or are you getting any type of outside pressure of, you know, taper some of your messes because you're, you're influencing the marketplace? I do. I get a lot of, uh, a lot of pushback. Uh, I've been called every name in the book from charlatan to everything else. It's, it's interesting. And all these addictions that you just stated, you know, from the opioids and we've got alcoholism and hard drug addictions. I mean, I think the difference here is those have very acute responses. In other words, if I go get intoxicated and I drive home, there's a, there's a high chance that something very bad is going to happen. And that is very newsworthy. And it's very, if, they, if tragedy, God forbid, ha- happens, uh, we all mourn that, and it's it's acute. It's right there. It's in the moment. It's there is more news appeal to that. But what we're not seeing, what we're not seeing, is that we have an addiction in this country that takes more lives than all of those put together. Now, a lot of people give me a lot of crap when I say that, but then we look at the statistics. What is the number one killer in America right now? Bar none, it's heart disease. Now, obviously, there's a lot of things that play into it. I'm not going to be the guy that's saying that it's just sugar addiction. I would never dream of doing that. But I will say that if we look at how many Americans are addicted to sugar, and we know the physiology of metabolic resistance and how it promotes the ethereal sclerotic process, which is inflammation, which is high cholesterol, which can lead to heart attack, if we understand 
how that process plays in over time. Again, it's not the acute go wrap your tree, your car around a tree, but over 20, 30 years, and now we see hundreds of thousands of Americans dying each and every year. We have to stop and scratch our heads and say, is this just as powerful or more powerful of an addiction and maybe even a more serious addiction because it's stealth? Nobody really cares. I mean, we'll, we'll kind of, you know, ha-ha, sugar addiction. It's, it's, yeah, we know I should lose weight. You know, look, look at my belt. I'm a little overweight. Ha-ha-ha. It's really not taken in a very serious light. And I personally believe that until we can start to see it for what it is and really understand that food addiction and sugar addiction in general are driving an absolute pandemic of disease and death, if we can't associate it with that, I just I believe we're just going to continually repeat the same cycle. Fortunately, I believe in the last 10 years we've made a lot of progress, and thank God for that. I believe that we are on the right path going back to our earlier conversation, a lot of our diets are not these quick fix diets. These are more lifestyle based diets, you know, anything from paleo to keto to intermittent fasting. And although none of those are perfect, at least we're starting to understand that this is lifestyle based and it's more, more than just a fad, more than just a quick fix. And I believe in time that we will start to equate, you know, our obesity rate, our, our, heart disease and everything else with what we're putting in our, into our bodies. And, and uh, we're going to start to recognize that sooner rather than later, I hope. David and I are in this meditation group and we have a doctor there. And, and so she mentioned that one of the contributors of heart disease is all the preservatives that are in the food that we didn't have a generation ago. And so if you look at the combination of all of it, it's, it's like the, uh, you know, you're getting together with the, the, the Department of Justice, <laughs> <I'm Yeah>. sorry, <laughs> and getting together with the, and put all your superpowers together and say as a collective, and and I'm kind of laughing at that, but because that's what you're competing against. You're competing against lobby, lobbyists that are getting these things pushed through, and on one level, yes, that that exists. But on the other side, I, I would think of um, the supermarket. We're always towed or grocery store, depending on where you live in the country. So anyway, you hear that it, you look at the, those that don't live here or those that aren't from here, so our immigrants. And when they go to the supermarket, it's totally different from when we go. When they go, they, they shop around the perimeter. That's where all the fresh food is. And sure. inside is what we're talking about. Yeah, you know, and so you're you're like you, before Amazon bought them. Everybody made the joke of whole check. I can't afford to buy that, and so you have people that are resulting to getting these quick fixes for economic reasons that have yeah. long term detriments as well. Well, you look at look look at the top farm subsidies. We've got soy, we've got corn. Throw in canola. These are garbage garbage foods in their process in their process form. Uh, it, all of these foods, high, you know, high fructose corn syrup. I mean, we're taking something that can be inherently nutritious and, it, quote, unquote, we bastardize it, and we make something that is completely illegitimate to its true natural form. And then you look at how all of these uh, subsidies are capitalized, and you look at the return on investment that a food manufacturer will get from, say, from a box of Lucky Charms, it is mind-blowing. I mean, these are very cheap foods that are being manufactured in mass quantities, and they are scientifically, not by chance, they are scientifically designed to hit key pleasure centers in our brains, make no mistake about it, to keep us addicted. And yeah. They're made very cheaply, and so you get, you know, uh, urban cities and, and lower-income areas that that's all that they can do. So it creates an economic perfect storm to where it's a vicious cycle, and even in the, the extreme low-income where there's welfare, really what everybody is buying is highly addictive substances that keep them enslaved and addicted for a lifetime. Well, the other side of that is – 
when I coach somebody and I say, okay, we need to switch out of some of this processed food and we need to get into more healthy eating, the first argument that I get is I can't afford it. It's too expensive. One perspective that I'd like to offer is, yes, what you see on the cash register is going to be a little more expensive. There is no question. I'm not arguing that. But let's look at the downstream costs. Let's look at medical expenses. Let's look at prescription drugs, therapist visits, both mentally and physically. And the list goes on and on and on. When you start to consider that, real healthy food becomes a real good deal. And even though you, it is an investment, I believe it's one that in time will definitely come out on the right end. Yeah. Griff, when did you know that you wanted to, uh, you know, have a, spend a, have a career in the, the health and fitness industry? <laughs> I believe I, I was very young. You know, I was... I was very health conscious. I was raised in the low fat era of the 80s and 90s. And so I was the weird, you know, nine, 10 year old that was counting calories and trying to get fat out of my diet. I was just a weirdo. My friends, I would be on the treadmill when it was, I live in Utah. And so I would be out on the treadmill in December when it was like 10 degrees outside. And and I was on a porch. There was just an open area. My friends would come out and they'd call me Richard Simmons and laugh at me and trip power. And, you know, like I said, it, it, they'd throw me a wig and give me two socks. I was always kind of the weird guy. And so I, I just learned really how I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to fight this anymore. I'm just going to embrace it. And I remember right around 15, I said to myself, I'm just going to, I'm going to be a health coach. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another and pretty much in one way or another, that's always what I've been from that time on. So <laughs> it's crazy. Right. Right. Wow. So let me ask you this. Is there anything in that journey, Griff, that like let's say 10 years ago that you were subscribing to, but now you've changed your 180 degrees on anything yes. in that system? Uh, go ahead. A couple things, yeah. One is I used to take – I'm kind of an ex- – you probably can tell, but I'm kind of an extreme personality, and I was the cold turkey guy. You know, I, I was a full-blown sugar addict, and I – one day I'm like, got to hell with it. I'm done. I am, I'm done. And, and when I put my mind to something, I'm just done. And I had a very low compassion rate for people that couldn't do the same. So it was a very myopic, uh, self-centered, you know, <laughs> point of view that I, that I started my coaching career with. And I found out very quickly that it was not working. <laughs> got a lot of... <laughs> Push back on that, and I, I really, on a serious note, I really learned to have compassion on people and compassion on myself. And um, I believe that we, you know, as, as serious as this subject is, in my opinion, I believe that there's a lot of room for self-compassion. And that if we don't have that, if we don't allow ourselves to fall and, and to be okay with that, it's going to be a long, hard journey for us all. And so, yeah, to answer your question there, I, I definitely believe that that, that part has changed. Um, I also believe that as we, as we get onto a journey, I used to believe that doing it all at once was the only way. The only way that we can truly succeed is by one small victory at a time. And that has been key in, in a lot of my addictive or addiction recovery services that I offer is showing uh, patients and clients that they are by one step, one little thing. If you can make one small victory, and, and then that could be having a third veggie for the day and literally celebrating that, that that will empower you mentally to continue to go on. You know, we live in such a perfectionistic society, and I've played personally into it far too often where if we're not all in, we're all out, and we're beating ourselves up. And I believe that for the vast majority of human beings living on this planet, that that is a huge mistake. You know, so if we can bring those two things, if we can bring in the compassion, we can do one thing at a time, I believe that's a pretty good recipe for success. Yeah, I, can, I completely agree. It's just like someone who's deciding that they want to go out and, and, you know, start running marathons. Well, you just don't go out and run 26 miles. Let's just see if you can run a mile first. <laughs> Let's get that. <laughs> and then you just kind of build on that, you know, the successes of those small ones, like you said. So, yeah, I completely agree with that. 
success to get success for sure. Yeah. I have a, a the other side of that equation to ask you, and since you're a fitness sure. person, I, I will definitely throw a fitness and a nutritionist. I want to throw you this softball, pun intended. So I have to give a shout out to everybody that has their counters full of herbs from the herb store. And I'm sure when people come to you for a consultation, they just feel, hey, if I just get every herb in the store, then I am good. What is the process of working with a nutritionist such as yourself? You know, it, it becomes very highly, highly individualized. That's the that's the key. And unfortunately, I mean, there's there's hundreds of herbs and there's hundreds of different supplements that we can take, but really what it comes down to is, first and foremost, finding out uh, either subclinically or clinically what's going on. You know, what is the body sensitive to? What is the body not sensitive to? And once we get a better understanding of those sensitivities, where we're low, what hormones are low or high, from there we can start to put it together a personalized plan. So to take a generalized approach, just like you say, buy every herb in the store, that can actually be very dangerous and very ill-advised. Even if there's some good stuff, if we're overdoing it and we're what's called in the industry stacking, if we're doing those kind of practices, uh, that can be very highly ill-advised because it can lead to a lot of toxicity, even though we're talking about herbs. If they're, if they're crossed, uh, if they're linked inappropriately, it can lead to a lot of uh, undesirable results. So it's got to be, I would just say this, uh, to know what kind of regimen to put a client on, it's got to be highly individualized, and, and most of the time that's going to have to come down to some clinical blood work and, and uh, a lot of uh, intake forms just to figure out what's going on and then taking it from there, if that makes sense. It does, and I do hear the blood aspect. I also hear on, in some other dark circles that they are looking at uh, feces as well. Do you go that deep or it's just purely blood work? You know, I, I do go that deep. I, I believe that the, the bacterial count of, the, of feces is just absolutely uh, revolutionary. And there's a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's a story to be told is what, I, is what I mean to say with that. And as gross as it sounds, our bacteria in that fecal bulk tells a very wonderful story. It can tell us how much uh, sugar we're having because there's bacteria down there that's growing, uh, that's running amok. It can also tell us on the other end, you know, how many vitamins or minerals we're deficient in. So these are new tools that are, are somewhat contemporary that we're finding that are very helpful in this individualization process that we can take a client and say, okay, you know, through blood work, through fecal analysis, and otherwise we can figure out what is needed for that individual, and then we can put it, put together an individualized plan from there. Mm. It's it's we're at the top of the hour, and it feels like we've only touched the tip of an iceberg. Hence your book. So I'd love for you to tell people about your book and how they can get in touch with you for a consultation. Do you do it just in your area, or you do Skype or Zoom, where people All can call above. in around the country? Uh, yeah, so absolutely. yeah, please. Please take the time to highlight your sites, your social medias, and any other way people can get in touch with you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, really the, the best way to, to get in contact with me as far as like social media, uh, my website's actually the best way. It's griffnilson.com, and it's N-E-I-L-S-O-N. There's a million ways to spell that. Uh, but that's the best way. I'm on Facebook uh, under Griff Nilsson. That's my handle on just about everything. Um, as far as my book, really what that is, it's a little bit different. I, I kind of took a curveball when I wrote the book. And what I wanted to accomplish with that is just give the reader a step-by-step, just like we were talking about, a step-by-step approach to where they can change not only their physical habits, but also their mental habits, uh, their conscious habits and their subconscious habits. And really what it does is it gives a reader a, a step-by-step 60-day plan that they can take and implement in a very easy-to-use format. So it's, uh, it's, it's a different kind of book. It's more holistically based. And, 
it, it really the, the beauty of it is that it doesn't overwhelm the reader. So, and that's obviously my biased opinion. They'll have to be the judge of that. But uh, <laughs> they can find that on Amazon. Uh, and as far as like I said before, griffnilson.com, they can go there and. And really what I'm up to a lot now is keynote speaking and speaking to different organizations. So if anybody ever needs like a health or wellness speaker, uh, I would love and be honored to do that. Fantastic. And, and before we go, and I think it's apropos of what we were, David was ta- and you were talking about a little earlier, Griff, I want to give a shout out to my good friend, Joanne. Uh, she had a colonoscopy today. And like you were saying with the intermittent fasting, that you can't even get a get that procedure done without fasting the day before and liquid. So, I mean, it, even the, the mainstream science community believes that on some level that fasting has to be done in your life. And I know uh, personally for, for me, uh, I meditate, and, and when I, if I fast before meditating, it seems like the, the experience far, out, see, far uh, outstrips if I've had ice cream and all that before doing a meditation. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> I definitely wanted to throw that back out there since you didn't totally poo-poo ice cream. <laughs> no, ice cream's a bomb. I love ice cream. <laughs> Shout out to ice cream. <laughs> Shout out to ice cream. Um, David, you have any other questions? I think we covered it. I think we covered it all. Yeah, it was. A, it was. I was. I would say it was a sweet hour, but it was a great hour nonetheless. <laughs> we can go there too. We can go there too for sure. <laughs> uh, Griff Nielsen, it, it was a pleasure. Uh, you have been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza, and I'm David. Griff, let's stay in touch. It, it definitely will not be for Valentine's Day, though. All right, my friends. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you for saving me. <laughs> sure. Have a good one. Thanks for your time, man. You too, guys. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast. Please check us out on our website at intrinsicmotivation.life where you can click on the speak pipe button and leave any suggestions for a future podcast that you'd like us to cover. Also check us out on our social media sites. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook page, iTunes podcast, in addition to Stitcher and Google Play, all under Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. Check you out next time. Have a great day.